The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, almost a Japanese ace. Triathlon, comparing early SPAAGs and Metal Beasts, the ground thunderbolt. We started showcasing the new vehicles with the famous American attack aircraft, the Thunderbolt II. And today's metal beast is its ground counterpart. Please welcome one of the most unusual anti-air vehicles in War Thunder, the LAV-AD. Its main caliber is a two-plane stabilized 5 barrel 25mm autocannon with elevation angles ranging between minus 8 and plus 65 degrees. This machine can also be equipped with Stinger-guided missiles and rockets. The engine compartment is in the front, next to the driver, two more crew members sit in the turret, and the transmission is found at the bottom. For additional equipment, it has thermal vision devices and smoke launchers. So why do we call the LAV-AD a ground thunderbolt? There's more than one reason for that. First, it's the gun. The five-barrel, 25mm Gatling feels like the Avenger's younger brother. And while the A-10's gun was made to destroy ground targets, an anti-air vehicle's major target is, <laughs> well, aircraft. It's pure joy using this gun against them. Just a couple of hits are enough to break an enemy vehicle to smithereens. Second, this American machine can equip up to eight Stinger guided missiles. The early modification isn't too efficient due to a high chance of missing, but the upgraded modification K with a proximity fuse does its job excellently. Yet, enemy aircraft will run out sooner or later, and that's when anti-air vehicles need to start helping Allied tanks. For this task, the ammo pool includes discarding Sabot rounds penetrating up to 90 mm of armor, quite enough for IFVs and the sides of MPTs. You can also equip a block of HE rockets, but that will take away half of the stingers. The rocket's effect is more psychological. The enemy is unlikely to expect a rocket salvo from an anti-air vehicle. It's hard to achieve full destruction with them, though. The penetration is pretty low, and the pool is rather shallow. So, what do we have here? A rotary cannon? Check. I, uh, Guided missiles? Check. Rockets? Check. Basically an A-10, just with a different chassis. And speaking of chassis, eight wheels ensure outstanding mobility on solid ground, but feel kind of unsure off-road. Sometimes it's better to take the longer road than sink into mud on the shortest path. A few other advantages include amazing elevation angles and an exceptional aiming speed, one that tanks at this rank can only dream about. Add some thermals and a laser rangefinder, and the LAVAD is superb at any distance and time of day. USNAF Captain Joe Foss had always been a jolly, cheerful guy. But this time he was ecstatic. His dream came true. Finally, he could see Guadalcanal under the wing of his wildcat. Pure hell crisscrossed by bomb craters, overgrown by impassable jungle, full of snakes, scorpions, mosquitoes, and the Japanese. It was the latter that Captain Foss was so eager to meet. And that was the reason he actually came here. Oh, here they are. Speak of the devil, bringing their zeros and bettys to bomb the poor Henderson Field. And who said a fighter pilot doesn't get a victory in their first battles? The closest four Japanese planes scattered and one of them got right into his sights. Open fire. It ignited. The remaining three are already tailing, eager to avenge their friend got to get lower, under Allied protection. They'll drop the chasers and the anti-aircraft guns will give them some cover. 
The bullets are splashing all over the Wildcat's armor. Phew, the Japs are off. Time to land. But the landing gear won't deploy. The engine is sneezing, and now we'll have to land the poor fighter onto his belly, right into the bombed airfield's hot mud. The plane was shred to pieces while Captain Foss climbed out unscathed. What's next? A new Wildcat, and a new attempt to claim an air victory, with the exact same result. A dive attack onto a careless Zero, a short dogfight with the rest, a retreat down to the Allies, another reckless Japanese fighter pushing too much ahead, downed. Then another emergency landing with a fighter damage beyond repair, two to one. Now that's a better score. Time to fly Wildcat number three. Cheerful Joe Foss managed to bring down a twin-engined recon aircraft and a float plane while piloting this one, and even keep the machine whole. Technically, he was already an ace, but to no satisfaction yet. A fighter pilot becomes a true ace only after handling five enemy fighters. Moreover, Captain Foss finally realized that dogfighting a Zero wasn't the best idea. What then, dive onto them? Well, you don't always have a chance to gain enough altitude. Meet them up front, then. Why bother when you've got six Brownings against an armorless flying fuel tank? The idea worked out just great. In the next bomber interception mission, the Wildcat squadron was attacked by Japanese fighters from above. Boss made a zoom climb and managed to down two planes in 10 seconds in a frontal attack alone against a whole group. And then he downed a Betty as well. Well, now he's become a true ace on his ninth day in the front lines. In his next mission, Foss downed two more Zeros, albeit sustaining heavy damage himself. Again, another wildcat spread over the airfield. Ah, so what? He'd get a new one. Later, there was a battle where Joe Foss joined last, taking off later than the main group. The enemies ignored his arrival since the battle was already on. That was a mistake. First, one Zero caught fire thanks to Captain's Brownings, then another one that made the poor decision of climbing straight up, then a frontal attack with a third one. Joe's engine stopped, but the Japanese plane broke apart. Wildcats don't fly with a dead engine, so he had to make another emergency landing onto the edge of the airfield. The final diagnosis for his plane was straightforward. This one ain't flying no more. Joe responded that he'd already crashed four Wildcats and almost become a Japanese ace himself, to the loud laughter of his colleagues. All he needed to do was crash another one. But fate seemed to have something else in mind. The cheerful Joe Foss was soon stricken down by a bad case of malaria, so he had to be evacuated to a hospital for a while. As it was often the case, they wanted him off the battlefields after the sickness, but it didn't work out. Foss demanded a Corsair and headed off to battle again. He pushed his personal score all the way to 26, but never became a Japanese ace since he never lost a plane again. We've already had a competition of top SAMs and a triathlon among mid-tier SBAAs. Now it's time to test the earliest machines in this class. Please welcome the participants, the American M13 MGMC, the German SD KFZ-62, the Soviet Gaz AAA D Shka, the British Staghound AA, the Japanese Tase the Italian AS-42, the P-70AA from France, and the PVLVV FM-42 from Sweden. As is tradition, we'll start off with an off-road race across snow, sand and marsh. Our contestants line up at the start near the tractor. A fitting background for them, don't you think? Let's go. The British vehicle gains a lead right away, followed by the Japanese. Then right behind we see the AS-42, the M13, the Gaz, and the Swedish one. German and French vehicles lag behind. 
After a few dozen meters, the gaps widen, but look at the leader, head to head. The snowy part slows the Soviet and British machines, but gives the M13 an advantage. The wheeled vehicles get another chance in the desert, and the British and Italian vehicles gain the lead again. The marsh allows the American, German and Japanese crews to take over. And here's the finish line. Some contestants shoot back for an additional tiny speed bump. The British vehicle breaks off the main group almost at once, and finishes first. Then we see the Italian come in second, the American third, and the Swedish vehicle fourth. The German team scores fifth place at the last moment, and then we see the Tasse and the Gas, and it looks like we have to wait for the French one. Now, let's see what these SPAAGs can do against tanks. We'll take the Chiha medium tank for a target and place it with its front facing us at a close distance. No matter how hard the French crew tries, they have no luck destroying the target. The American, British and Soviet anti-aircraft guns are almost helpless against the frontal armor. Only the commander's cupola and the flat area near the driver's hatch are penetrable. Other contestants seem to be doing way better. The guns of the Japanese, Italian and Swedish vehicles have no issues penetrating both the turret and the hull. The best anti-tank capability is shown by the German machine. Its 37mm HE rounds leave no chance for the enemy. Well, it's time to test the main mission for anti-aircraft guns. Shoot some aircraft. We'll have a squad of Swedish B-17B bombers for targets. Thanks to a high rate of fire, the French team spends little time finding the lead and downs all targets. The American and British ones complete the mission pretty quickly, too. Their twin guns with huge ammo pools allow for almost uninterrupted fire. Next, we see the Italian and the Japanese crews eliminating air threat. Their 20mm cannons require way fewer hits to destroy enemy aircraft. The Swedish machine has similar firepower, but not enough ammo for all of the planes. And the last to report success are the Soviet and the German crews. Their low rate of fire explains their slow speed. Let's sum up. The Audience Choice Award goes to the French Battle Tractor for its unique look. The bronze goes to the American M13 for its balanced performance. The silver goes to the Italian AS-42 for its amazing speed and a rapid 20mm autocannon with a large ammo pool. And the winner today is the British Staghound for demonstrating the best mobility and its versatile weaponry. Let's leave our happy contestants to fire into their skies to express their emotions. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent in by a player called WellGGBro. What's the best way to play helicopters? Example, YAH-64 or AH-1F? Hi there. The best way to play helicopters is to use anti-tank guided missiles at low altitudes. Get to the ground battlefield close enough to be in range of your missiles. Peek out of cover, which might be a building, a landscape feature or a forest. Launch the ATGM and hide back right away. FSO Crypto asks, Is it possible to shift gears manually with ground vehicles? Hi Crypto, of course. Just go to the menu, Controls, Ground Vehicles, Movement, and assign two keys for Ground Vehicle Transmission Gear, Cruise Control, Up and Down. Another question comes from Thomas Samuels. What do the binoculars in the bottom left HUD mean? Hello, Thomas. It shows the perception level of your crew. The more tankers you lose in battle, the worse it gets. 
And the last comment today was written by Rauwijk. Could you tell us something about the Dutch World War II planes, like the Fokker D-21 and the Fokker G-1? Hi there. That's a great idea. Thanks. See it in one of our next Pages of History episodes. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. And the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. And you know why. Don't forget to leave a like and remember not to shout the gas vehicle's names because it's so difficult to pronounce when you're in a hurry. Share your thoughts and comments and <laughs> we'll see you next week.